This is Reckless Airwaves Radio. This is Rob from the Rob and Some Show. Check us out every Wednesday on IPMNation.com forward slash live two. You are listening to Reckless Airwaves Radio. Hey everyone, this is John Corrigan, host of Corrigan's Corner and the editor of The Wrestling Estate, welcoming you to Reckless Airwaves Radio. This is Frank Cagino, host of Frank About Sports on YouTube, and you're listening to Reckless Airwaves Radio. Hello, hello out there. This is Tony Myers, a.k.a. Chainsaw Tony, FMW Leather, Leatherface. And you're listening to Reckless Airwaves Radio. Don't touch that dial. Reckless Airwaves Radio. This is Frankie McDonald. I'm doing great. You're listening to the Reckless Airwaves Radio. Hey, this is Reckless Airwaves model Valerie, and you're listening to Reckless Airwaves Radio. Uncensored, unfiltered, unforgiving radio. And be sure to check me out on the site at RecklessAirwaves.com. Welcome to Reckless Airwaves Radio. Uncensored, unforgiving radio that's always willing to push the limits. We don't care about political correctness. We don't need anyone's approval. And we do what we want. We are ready to wreck the airwaves. This is Reckless Airwaves Radio. Hey, how you doing, Tony? Uh, How you been? I'm doing good. How about you? Oh, always. uh, You know, every time I talk to you, man, I'm always much better. (laughs) <laughs> this is always a fun interview, right? Always. I mean, it's, it's one of the things you really look forward to that I look forward to. Uh, I get so, I get to get so much off of my chest and get to pretty much, uh, you know, audibly uh, quote out the stuff that I just don't want to fade from my memory, too. So right. <laughs> therapeutic <laughs> also. Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, Tony, I see you got the COVID shot. Both of them, yeah. Um, it's it's one of the things at my job because I work around food and we also provide a lot for the hospital. Um, so take that into what you will. You know, you could read between right. the lines there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'll touch on tonight where you could read between the lines and tell what I'm saying. But, right. yeah, um, so I got my second shot like a week ago and had all these weird symptoms, but, Oh, man, you know, that's what I was going to ask cool. you. I was going to say, how did it feel after you got it? I know a couple of people who got it, and they said they nothing, you know, a little pain in the arm. Uh, maybe one person, I think, said they felt a little tired. They don't even know if it had that had to do with the shot. I haven't really heard anybody say they really had anything bad happen, though. Thank God. Yeah, Mickey Knuckles, uh, Mickey Knuckles works at a hospital, and, and she wound up going right back to the hospital. She works at uh after her second shot, it was um, but hers was like an like a bacterial thing that was going on in her stomach. My stomach felt real queasy. I was able to yeah. keep down food, but I was finding these like one or two second lags when I was just on my feet. It was the weirdest thing, and um, you know, tie into that with with my stomach just feeling queasy and just feeling like uh, almost feeling like I just at any given point in time wanted to heave and vomit, you know. But oh man, I- um. That, that's the, that's yeah, never that, a good feeling. You know, they say that the worst um, pain you'll feel is a puncture wound. So, um, right. but th- this, the guy's looking at me all weird. The kid's got tattoos all over his forearms and arms, and I thought, my goodness, even if he's a male nurse, you know, right. to to take one look at my scar tissue and kind of cock your face like he was, I was like, well, look at you. <laughs> you know, I mean, you so know what I what I. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I got with my scars, man, they're they're cheaper than tattoos, and to me, they have a bit of a more interesting story. This guy, right, right. you know, yeah, the, the girl that did it the first time on my first shot, she was like, oh, I've seen worse. I go, I can imagine that you have, but, you know, because uh, all the time, and especially at water parks, I get the really weird stares, but uh, uh, even when I got the shot for the stuff in Kenya, 
Um, because you know there's malaria over there, man. They got bugs bigger than oh, yeah. their hands. Uh, yeah, you, even her, and you could imagine Kenya. She's seen a lot of crazy stuff come through her way, and the lady oh, yeah. was, uh, she was, yeah, she was just like, holy Jesus, and then she just went to my other arm and realized that was about as bad as the other arm. <laughs> <laughs> So were you someone who, I mean, obviously you got it because of work, but were you someone who was hesitant to get it but just got it because, you know, you got to do what you got to do for work? Yeah, and I didn't feel like being a guinea pig for anything. or. Right. <clears throat> but then I realized all the other people that already had the shots, uh, the horror stores aren't out there, and I did it best I could to research it and, and said, all right, you know, I mean, uh, at this point there's, I'm not losing out on anything, you know, it's being offered to me. So, right. and, um, yeah, the, it was weird because the first set of people, uh, that I went and got the shot done around were all like 20 years older than me. And then the second set of people was the biggest mixed bag of like, you know, uh, it, it's probably cause I was talking before I went in there, but I could have I saw like an Eskimo an Indian dude, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Like like the full gamut of people that you could imagine, you know. Right. I was like, well, what is this? It looks like a meeting at the up, United Nations. Where did you get it? Did you get it like at a – well, obviously, I don't think it would have been a CVS, right? What, did you go to like a facility to get it or something? No, this was at an actual like hospital hospital, the Mid-Atlantic oh. Care. Um, and they've ordered from, you know, our catering company so many times in the past. And uh, it came up with an opportunity, and they realized, hey – you guys are going to be handling our food. So, you know, yeah. it was one of those, you know, one hand washes the other kind of deals. Right. But, um, yeah, it was a, a real mixed bag, so no telling how these other people were able to get their shots. But, yeah, I mean, right. um, yeah, and, and people were just kind of, I don't know, it, it was like such a weird vibe in the room, you know. It was like a bunch of strangers, no one's talking to each other really, no one's even looking at each other. Yeah. Everybody was just going on about their business and like a really they just wanted to get it over with. Kind of way. Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm and then they put you. In the, I was going yeah, to get mine. I'm just waiting for. I'm just waiting for. Uh, like I look on CVS. I want to get it either at a CVS or or the doctor. You know, just my regular doctor. I'm thinking probably CVS. But you go on their website. You know, around where I live, and all you see is fully booked. You know, basically over the whole Long Island. So. God knows when I'm going to get yeah. in line. Probably the summer when everybody starts getting sick of getting the shot or or have already gotten the shot. It'll probably open up. But, yeah, that, I, I'm playing the waiting game. Yeah, they have the uh, 15 minutes, like an observation thing that they keep you in. And there's, like, right, there's right. some crackers and there's some crackers and tang up there. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's <laughs> almost like a pod of pass out. Yeah, everything's, like, divided off and everything. And, yeah, everyone's just on their phone and, I was making a Facebook status update going, hey, I got my shot, and I had more people ask me, like, how the hell did you get it, you know? Right, right. Uh, yeah, it ties into a, a lot of what um, I could get into tonight about Japan, and um, they're expecting their fourth wave to hit really hard, so they have pushed back all their vaccina vaccination shots and everything. So, and, and it really ties into me having to go back there and everything, and, um, you know, it, the cat's out of the bag about Onita launching a brand new company, so um, bringing up the ashes. <laughs> so, well, um, but, well, hold on a second. Why why are they pushing back getting the vaccine? Because they think a fourth wave is coming. Shouldn't they be they pushing think the vaccine? This, you would think, but with the fourth wave coming, they're they're convinced that it won't be the same. I'm trying to think of the right wording. They don't think strength? that it'll be strong enough. Yeah, they don't think that the strength of it will be strong enough if a fourth wave is coming and it just burst upon the scene. It's like, well, then what we've been doing up to this point hasn't worked. So it's um, – and I, I've, like, stayed in touch nonstop with the embassy over there because I'm going, when – you know, i got to get back to work. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's – they're expecting their fourth wave to hit. And it messed up like the target timing on all when everybody was supposed to get their vaccine shots, and you know, it just kind of sent things into like a domino effect kind of over there. But uh, you know, they're that's the one thing I'm amazed at with the Japanese people's their level of acceptance, you know, about everything. 
yeah, your your father died. Oh, well, I gotta go to work. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I can't fix it. Like the their level of accepting things and getting over them is just like, you know, I've said it before. I don't know how you get 137 million people to behave like that in a place that's the size of the state of Minnesota. But right, it's also well, a good would, thing. You would think also that like you know even if you get the um, the COVID vaccine anywhere in the world, not just here or Japan, that that you know if something comes along that's a little stronger that they, you know they, maybe they can make a booster shot for it but then you got to start all over you know and start giving booster shots to all the people who already have it and there's going to be so many people that haven't even gotten the first shot yet it just seems endless yeah and it's really screwed up everything like japan alone you know with the, the olympics and everything but uh worldwide i mean it's weird i still talk to some people out in kenya um good female friend of mine from Uganda and she's like everybody just goes on about like normal everyday life here like there's nothing anybody can do about it and it's like yeah they take like some precautionary methods but it's like you know it, it's not like over the top like here stateside you know and can't enter a building without a mask and, and that kind of thing but um, there's got to be some kind of theory or science behind them doing you know but uh, they themselves too. They're very accepting of whatever's thrown at them. Where Americans are very like, almost like confrontational and argumentative. They want they want reasoning. Right. <laughs> the, yeah. They're not willing to. You know, they get to vote Democrat or Republican or whatever's on the ballot. You know, uh, yeah. whereas other nations have been, you know, fed in a lifetime that you just accept things for what they are, face value. Right. Right. Yeah. So what? So what, when you were talking to the embassy, what did they say? Are you uh, going back to Japan in the fall, like you like you think? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely gonna have to wind up there by the fall because that ties into a you know pre existing work visa with Magic Box Pro and um, WWS World Wing Spirit. And what happened was the very last show that they ran, the city stepped in and were like. You're not properly zoned to do this, and, you know, WWS crowds, especially in Bogo's hometown, to this day, still draw, like, a 1,000 people at random, you know, um, because people just go there almost like a graveyard, and they resurrect, I think I've told you this before, up on the stage with this picture and everything, and people leave gifts and that kind of thing, and right, right. two, they want to assure that the promotion in his hometown survives forever because, you know, that's where he did a lot of growing up. Um, he grew up there as a kid. And, you know, these people have known him for 60, 70 years, some of the elderly people, and it almost became like folk folklore. Like this guy went all over the world and, and damn near became mayor here and had a restaurant here and lived here and moved back here after, you know what I mean? So yeah. um, they moved yeah. it to Magic Box Pro's building which is in Saitama, but they rented all these buses to bus all the people that, you know, had the tickets that they had purchased. And, you know, Onita was in the main event again, um, team with Miss Mongol, um, you know, in a six man death match. And um, so it's great to see Magic Box Pro. Uh, Onita and WWS will work for, you know, forever to the end of time together. Um, but there was like real, real heat when my Magic Box Pro started up because they always looked at Masami and said, this is the kind of thing you could have found the financial backer for WWS that would have given us a dojo and given us a, a brand new building and stay the art complex and the gym and everything that Magic Box Pro has. Um, I, I took like a 60 second video. I'm pretty sure I sent that to you where it's just me filming the grounds of Magic Box Pro and showing everybody what's what. Yeah. Uh, including their head offices and all that good stuff. But um, long story short, I must be back there uh, by October because actually December is when my two-year deal expires with Magic Box Pro. So it's like I have to actually be there physically to sign. Um, what happened in the meantime is if you're not an essential worker, they're just going to shun you at the border. No matter if you spend your two weeks in quarantine and all that good stuff. So the idea, and this came right from Onita, who was like, well, we have to get you, you know, you have to be here. So he's in the midst of 
launching, he's going to wind up with several restaurants that he launches, like a whole chain that he's going into partnership with, with old friends. And there's already like a couple coffee shops over there that he runs, um, that he's in charge of. Um, this is just something, you know, while he's not in the ring, this is something he's passionate about. And, um, of course, like I said before, you could do the whole read between the lines thing. Easily, you can be an essential, you know, have an essential, be an essential worker with your work visa if you're working in a restaurant providing food. For pro wrestling, you know, and this is what's been described to me at best by the embassy, with pro wrestling, it's going to damn near be impossible to be labeled an essential worker. So, right. We have to find so you our basically just say it. that you're returning there to uh, work at the restaurant. Exactly. That's the yeah. easiest, you know, way around everything. The thing is, is that the vaccine, you know, the vaccination and, and all those shots and everything like that, they're expecting this fourth wave to hit in the spring. So Onita and his partners pulled back and said, well, then it's going to have to be summertime going to have to be the summertime or post summertime after this big fourth wave is hit and that you know they've made these vaccine vaccination shots and everything available to the public because the ones coming up are the ones that are going to be available to damn near everybody in the whole country right. you know the government has went through great expense to make sure that it happens and um how this all ties in okay um so Two weeks ago, Onita and Miss Mongol did the FMW reunion that was at Todekin Wrestling Museum, and it was right there on the spot that Onita uh, Onita went on record and said, FMW can't die at this point. And he's like, and now more than ever, and especially with the AEW thing, and he saw the outpouring of so many people from America saying, this must be done, you know, that we want our fix we want to see the new stuff in Japan. We want to see bombs, you know, and explosions that really work. So Onita went on record and said, we are launching a brand new FMW. He didn't give it a name, but the name being batted around is FMW Triple E, which the Triple E stands for um, entertainment and, of course, explosion, but also evolution because it's like FMW is evolving into 2021. Um, either that or go with FMWE and, you know, FMW-E and the E stands for explosion or just call the company FMW Explosion. But um, their whole deal is, and he's looking into pro wrestling tees is one of the things that can distribute his T-shirts and that kind of thing. Uh, I myself have looked for the best pay-per-view provider, um, streaming, uh, web and that kind of thing uh, here in the states, so that it will be available available to people here and people worldwide for the most part. So you know all the plans are in order and everything. It's just it's going to take a bit of doing, but the very first event is scheduled for spring. So um, take that as you will, you know, because uh, with with the other things going on and you know with us still being in this whole COVID thing, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could see the pieces of the puzzle coming together. Well, I thought the announcement was basically just that they were just coming up with like kind of like their own version of a WWE network. I didn't know it was going to be like a. They're just basically trying to just revolutionize the promotion, right? Just trying to get it out there more. And you'll see more and more detail surface as they come up. I'm not going to go like you know some things. You know, I, I still in a way believe in kayfabe. And yeah, there's you can't reasons tell why. Everything. Yeah, there's reasons why, as far as this goes, because there's so much being batted around that, you know, I can't explain and expose every single detail that you know is being worked on and and that kind of thing. But um, they want to go with monthly, like big events. You know, they're going to run regular house shows, and they might air, you know, some of the results from the house shows or some of the footage of the explosions and that kind of thing, but. Um, you know, their plan, the tentative plan right now is to go with 30 or $35 for like, um, pretty much for like a pay-per-view, pay-per-view like format, like how AEW has theirs. Um, they figured they wouldn't go more expensive than what 
AEW charges. But, you know, it's pretty much it's the talent and the undercard. I mean, he's going to go back to the original format of taking anybody who is not signed up with a major company. And and there you have it, uh, just as long as there's talent there to work with. You know, there'll be right. comedy and everything under the sun, how the old FMW was structured and pretty much how um, – WWS World Wing Spirit is structured where there's a bit of everything for everyone, you know, a boxer versus karate guy, you know, and all those kind of things. Um, but their idea is, yeah, to go with like pretty much like a major event monthly and then see, you know, based upon how they do with pay-per-view buys and streaming and, and that kind of thing, um, see if what they're charging is the right price, see if it's worth it to the people get good feedback and you know my idea coming off the top is and and i said it i'll be true to my word if those explosions do not work i myself will go through whatever legality i have to to provide a money back guarantee because uh me myself you know i'm sick of dealing with it and i'm sick of hearing it every time something's on u.s soil it does not work and you know, ultimately, the the plan down the line is get Onita back here because there's several promotions here stateside that want to use him and and that kind of thing. But um, if we're going to go that far, it it has to work. <laughs> it can't it can't be. You know, we the both of us knew me, him, his girlfriend. We would just sit there and you know, kind of brainstorm. And I told him going into the AEW thing, and he said the same thing. He's like. It's not going to work. And then what happened, happened. <laughs> but right. two, right. two of the both of us just kind of told each other, you know, in, in a strange way, we're not there to bash it. We're not there to trash it apart and be like, oh, you see that? Only we can do it right. No, it's not that. It's, um, you know, really to me, it's more about the people that were sold on it and spent $50 and saw that and were disappointed. You know, uh, I feel bad for the people that tuned in to watch it, and and that's what they got, you know. Well, let me ask you a few I questions feel... on that, because that's actually a, bit, uh, a part of what I wanted to ask you about in this interview. Was that Kenny Omega, John Moxley, Electrify Barbed Wire match at AEW? Um, the first thing is, you, isn't, it, isn't it true that you're never going to see the kind of explosions that you see in Japan because of... You just can't do that in the United States with your building codes and stuff like that. You can't just fill up the building with smoke, you know, like that. Yeah, it's zoning laws. It's primarily right. not only that. I mean, you know, I know he did whatever damage control he could do. I think it's ridiculous just to point it off on the heel like, oh, he built a dud. And then trying to be like, ha, ha, look at me. I'm one of the smart marks that are smart. and I'm catering to the smart marks. And there you go. There's our storyline. or whatever. No, you know, everybody saw what happened. Everybody knew what happened. Um, to the best of my knowledge, none of that, none of it was tested. It was just going on the whim right there, like, this is going to work. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to be big bombs. <laughs> And then um, <clears throat> the people got what they got. But it's primarily zoning laws. And you even see at rock concerts, uh, pyro itself. I mean, you've never seen a huge explosion. That just doesn't happen. Right. They're not zoned for it. Uh, there's so many state laws that are, you know, it, it would have to be done in a mainstream, you know, obviously a mainstream, you know, kind of forum. But, um and almost like an underground thing is exactly right. how, if you're going to pull it off, that is how it would have to be done. I mean, Can they do something like that never, outside? I think they could, and they could get away with it. But then again, I mean, all it takes is a couple complaints to a fire marshal, and, oh, my God, these people are setting off bombs. And Even right. if it isn't an open, <laughs> secluded field. Right. You know? Yeah. And then, um, two... Uh, you know, is one of those other things I, I was talking about. Um, years ago, and, and a lot of people don't know this for the record, <clears throat> they tried to bring Onita in and do an explosion match with him and Sabu in XPW. And everyone's like, oh, Onita screwed him. No, he didn't. 
Onita wanted to fly his entire crew with all the stuff, you know, they would have like separate compartments. However, they would have to fly it on like a private jet. And so he wanted to be compensated money-wise for bringing in this entire crew on top of him wrestling. And XPW just thought that was a ridiculous price to ask. And I, I thought the funniest part of the whole story was I said, Americans just don't have the engineering. And then uh, he got this funny look on his face. And he he looks over at his old lady and he kind of smiles and she goes, actually, the secret is all that stuff was built in America. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, that's funny because, you know, when they talk about Japan bashing, buy American, buy American. Every last one of those engine blocks in the cars, you know, American-made yeah. cars from Japan. Yeah. <laughs> Chevy, Ford, most of that, most of them, you know, the metallic materials and everything. Yeah. Almost like, what is it, like 90, 95% of that is built in America down to right. the engine block. Right, right. Well, you know, or it was actually, I'm, I'm sorry, it's imported from Japan. It's imported from Japan into, you know, American into you America. know, cars. Right, right. Yeah. I was going to ask you though, by America, you know, as, as far as the, the the Omega Moxley match, what did you up until the ending? Let's leave the ending separate for a second. What did you think of the match up until that point, though? What you know, was the uh, the exploding barbed wire at least passable? Yeah, I went back because I had to watch the whole thing because I go, it's not fair just to watch an explosion and be like, poof, you know, hey. Right. Um, so, you know, I went back and somebody had sent me, went back and watched it. And um, it's weird because Onita himself spent $50 in order because, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but up until that point, and I said it, I go, up until that point, as far as an explosion match and bats and barbed wire, I go, that damn near blew away anything I've ever seen. And Onita was like, that was so, he's like, those two are good. And he knows who Omega is. And I mean, Moxley, he's not that familiar with, you know, he knows of Moxley by proxy. Yeah. Yeah. But um, up until that point, I mean, those two were absolutely incredible. They were having an unbelievable match. And I just hate how much is going to be taken away from that because of, you know, the lack of explosion and that kind of thing. I just, really not fair if you get to looking at it, you know, yeah. just to look at that explosion and every bit of effort that they tried to put in before that is completely written off and forgotten of all because yeah. of that. Now you, yeah, you the, know, uh, you've been involved in these matches before you've been there. I'm sure when they set these things up, you know, what explosion, the explosions are look like and, and what they're supposed to, what, what in your opinion, just from what you saw, obviously, what was supposed to happen at the end? Was it supposed to be a gigantic bomb going off on both sides of that ring, you know, with all the smoke? Or, or, or was it not supposed to be that? It was supposed to be a big kaboom, and I just felt so bad. You know who I really felt for, it, including all the fans that got sold on something that didn't deliver, who I really felt for more than anybody is poor Eddie Kingston, you know, oh, yeah. who was in the was world's in the most un Yeah. Yeah. What an unenviable position. And Kingston himself is one of those guys. I went to Onita with him, and, and Pogo was sold on him. Pogo's like, I like this guy, you know? And um, I think I covered that story when Pogo wanted to do, like, an eight-man guy gene tournament where um, it was like a hybrid-style tournament. Like, um, first round, it's just, like, pure wrestling and everything. Like, you know, uh, you're allowed to, like, hit the ropes, but you're not allowed to go outside the ring. Like, everything is, like, kind of like grappling, you know, like, who is the best, who's the workhorse here? You know, inside cradles, um, roll-ups, and that kind of thing. And then the second round he wanted to do, this was at Karokin Hall. And then he was going to put the rest of the WWS, like, undercard, you know, all over. And then probably, you know, have him and Onita in the main event, as he always did. But, right. um, and he went through the process of selecting eight guys that he wanted bad, you know, that were like, you know, and um, he goes... I don't want guys who are guys that you know that are already over here. Like, no, Japanese people have seen them already. He's like, I want to go for something all the way new. And each of the people that just wound up being on his radar, uh, Kingston was one of them, you know. And, and 
And I was like, my God, can you imagine if he makes it to the second round of this thing? Like, he gets to show Pogo what he's really all about, you know? So, um, yeah, it was like, um, so Eddie himself, you know, I went to bat for and uh, had had some conversations with him. And then the untimely passing of Pogo, and, of course, none of it got to pan out. But for years, I always looked at Kingston. I go, promos alone, why the hell isn't this guy signed somewhere? I don't we're past all the physique stuff. We're past all that, you know, other stuff. Like this guy, it's like everybody's missing the boat with this guy. And then lo and behold, you know, AEW and everybody gets to see what he is on a national basis. And, you know, he, he's been getting his praise, man. He's been getting his due lately. And, uh, you know, it's about time for him. But for him, as hard as he has worked and as much as he's busted his ass and all the shitty indies that he did for next to nothing all these years, and then, you know, that moment in time where he finally goes in there and finally, you know, big baby face turn and the poor guy's going to stand there and, you know, and, you know, have to oversell a big, you know, a little poof inside the ring. It's just, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> So what, what what went wrong there? Like, was was it just not rigged up right, or was it just not the right bombs that they picked? Because <laughs> I know nothing about this. You know that. Was it just the wrong? It wasn't bombs the right ever? bombs. Was it? <laughs> it was. It wasn't the right. You know, and it wasn't the the detonator and everything. And if you ever look at the explosive barbed wire bats, you know they use that same barbed wire. And if you look at the end of the bat, like look at the compilation of all the explosions that I took out there alone, you always see that huge thick cord hanging off the bat. It's a detonator and kaboom. And I mean, I've caught the worst end of that damn thing. There's a one time I had like a big dusty splotch, like right there on, you know, the top part of my stomach and everything. And that thing didn't go away. My skin felt like leather, you know? And so I felt the worst end of that. And um, I just knew going into it, I was like, there's no way. I was like, they have it rigged up the same kind of like, you know, it's sold as an explosion, but that's it's not going to be an explosion. Weren't they, um, you know, say what you want to about indoor, outdoor, you know, FMW did exploding ring outdoor. I mean, right. even then they had to work out some of their kinks early on because it wasn't, you know, but they eventually found the right, rigging and that kind of thing and they were able to sell it to people and deliver on their promise yeah, but yeah. uh no i was no, just i was you, pointing out how yeah oh uh, night after night I, w- I would sit there because they would carry it on the ring trial like if you had um no matter whose you know ring or whatever if it was karokin and it was somebody else's ring they were using well they would have a separate band for the explosives and that's everything you know um or they would have, like, I'm sorry, a separate van for, you know, because um, they wouldn't let them do any explosives. But they would still keep the same, like, barbed wire boards, and you would see them, like, stapling that on. Well, they had somebody completely entirely different doing that. Um, but to point out, like, when I did the Saitama tour, night after night, they would just put those same exact explosives right back onto the rain truck, you know, yeah. and they'd be ready to go the next night. And the female that they had in charge was one of the, you know, second night on on the Saitama uh, tour back in 2017. She took one of the explosives. And that was the night that I got a hard way, like right, uh, it's about an inch back from my forehead. And everyone just walked by me. They They thought I'd gig until the next night they saw it. And they were like, holy shit, you know. And Onita himself was like, my God. And he was like, all right, this is – he's like, this has got to stop. He's like, you're headbutting the goddamn chair. You're not holding still. He's like, you're getting too fidgety and too caught up, man. Um, anyway, uh, they would keep the same set of explosives, the same bats, the same detonator, uh, the same um, the same everything. It would just go town to town with us on the back of the ring truck. So you know if it – you know, which <laughs> – I don't know if I've ever told that story of the first night of not working, the big explosive with the barbed wire bat, and it took five fucking times. It's one of Ricky Fuji's favorite stories. He, he never stops laughing about it. He was like, that was some crazy shit. Because each time, it was like Onita was hitting me with the bat, 
and there was nothing. And then, you know, you see him looking over at um, at Hideki, uh, Taka, Hideki Takahashi, the actual owner of the last incarnation of FMW. And you see him looking up at him like, come on, fucking set this goddamn thing off. And then, you know, the second time died, and the third time you hear Onita's curse, and I'm swearing, you know, he's, he's going to cover me, and um, – He's doing the thing where he has to pick me up, and he can't cover me. He's like, no, no, and he's asking the people, you want to see explosion? Explode? You know, and you know, it's uh, got up, did it again, did it again. By the fifth time, when he went to, I guess that thing had been charging, it had been built up. I'd never hit with, I'd never been hit with a bigger explosive than that first night. <laughs> that goddamn thing hit me. And, you know, I'm trying to throw myself straight back and take a back bump. But, you know, I'm also throwing my feet up in the air so I could kind of rock back onto my neck so people could see me get, like, knocked on my ass from it. And um, it was just like that thing hit me so hard, it felt like it took, like, five seconds for me to actually land in the ring and back. I don't know what kind of height I got out of that fucking back bump, but it was just like, holy fucking shit, (laughs) you know? And it was funny because the boys were taking turns holding me, like, like, um, I think it was Yaguchi was holding me, then Hideki Osaka was holding me, and, you know, uh, different people were holding me, like, oh, fuck, man, they're talking to Onita, going, shit, man, it fucking didn't work. And you mm-hmm. could hear, like, panic, and I'm getting upset. But anyway, um, I would, night after night, I would just look at it, you know, because they would have it, like, set up all the way to the back, like, backed up against the wall, and they would put tape around it, you know, like caution tape, like this is dangerous, it explodes, and it does. But um, I knew just looking at it, the first time they pulled out the bat, I was like, there's no nothing attached to the bat. Where are they going to get the juice from? I was like, this is going to be one of those lame, like, pop gun things, like props they use in movies. And I just, I knew by looking at it right there, I'm like, oh, no. I was like, even the first explosion, I guess, with the bat, I was like, eh. the, the the barbed wire one with the ropes, not that bad. They could have gotten away with that, but yeah. the rest of them, you know, so, almost hate so to long. say it, but. No, go ahead. Yeah, I almost hate to say, like, I just, I'm not saying I told you so. Uh, I'm saying, like, I just, I knew it from the second I saw it, you know, I was like, this is a bad idea. So the ones that didn't go off in the corner, that's that, you know, obviously was the flop that just looked like sparklers. So Oof, were they were gross. they um were they just simply the wrong bombs? Were they not rigged up right? Were they not detonated right, or whatever you call it? I think they tried to do the ring pose as like a you know, like uh like maybe like a spark or thing, like like, oh, here it comes. But and then, then the, the bombs whole... go off after that, right? I mean, if, um, my God, it's almost like if they just dumped a bunch of cherry bombs into each of those four ring posts, if they were, uh, if they weren't welded at the top, it was like they would have at least gotten a big boom, you know, but, right. oh, Jesus. Uh, but supposed to be the whole, you know, big explosion. Oh, my God, the ring, it's getting ready. And, oof, that was. Who do you think they got, who uh, do you think that they brought in to do all that stuff? Is it just some fireworks company or something like that yeah it had to be and and coming off their budget there really is no um to me anyway there's no excuse to for that to happen especially with all the money you're talking about with AEW. but they must have went with a company just like oh these people oh they probably looked them up on the internet oh they got a five-star rating you know and but it's pretty obvious it would have cost them double the money if they if they said oh look Let's see what you got. Let's see, you know, how much of explosion are we talking about here? Oh, okay. You know, it's pretty obvious they just winged it that night because what ring did they have to test it out on? Right. They, you, you just, you know, good and well, there, there would have been, if they tested it out and thought that it was good, as much as those people have media presence, so help me God, they would have put that on their TV and been like, there it is, we tested it out. This is what we're looking at tonight, folks. You yeah, notice none of that footage existed of them testing it? They didn't test it. They didn't test it anywhere. This is this is AEW, where their top guys 
have shows where, you know, it's like being the elite, where they just go around and they do nothing but talk and bullshit and dick around. You know, Big Show has his own, uh, I guess, YouTube show with them. Right. You know, they would have at least shown something, a four-second clip of it. You know, hey, right. look, we tested it out earlier, folks. This what, especially how much money it would cost them just to test that shit out alone. Right. You know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We're we're past. We're so far. Wrestling wise, we're so far past the the entire, you know, carny aspect of that's not what they were going for. They just. It was disappointing, and they knew they laid a big egg, and you know, but uh, none of that stuff has ever been any problems overseas. And you know, um, two, it really gave Onita a swift kick in the balls because so many people had messaged him and tagged him and stuff, and um, his name was just dropped so much. Going, my God, why didn't they just? Onita himself should have brought that stuff here. Onita himself should have showed them how it works. Onita himself could have brought it. Let me ask you a question because I have a question about that. What was that thing that – what did he do? He just sent like a video to AEW? Wasn't he on the show or or the the, the Monday – not the Monday show, the the Wednesday show before that pay-per-view? I saw him talking on it. Yeah, and I asked him. I go, why didn't you speak any English there? Like your English is funny. He's like, ah. He's like, then then it just comes across as, like, cheap. He's like, yeah, you know, look. He goes, they know I'm Japanese. And he goes, and then they put the words on the bottom of the screen and everything. He goes, you know, uh, if I had enough time, I could have done it in English because it edited just right. And he was like, but they got a hold of him. And, you know, uh, one guy put it best. He was like, hey, man, I'll, I'll need to get paid for that. And I was just like, I believe in kayfabe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, because then people are going to start going, well, how much money you know, What they happened with yeah. the – remember the CZW thing? You were involved in that one too a couple of years ago where they tried doing the exploding yeah. bombs and all that. That didn't turn out well either, right? Not at all. And it's like last minute they didn't know what else to do, and they actually wound up going to John Zandig. And I go, if there's one guy that don't want to see this get pulled off, it's him. But they were so desperate at the time, and I searched all the outer limits of my mind going – you know, what can be done here? And at the time, Wild 7, Satoshi, who has since passed away of stomach cancer, um, we lost him like two, three years ago. He was going, oh, man, these bombs are bad. You know how bad this is going to look? It's going to make us look terrible. He's like, they don't need us. Got to stand there in the ring. And I can see the wheels turning when he's talking to me. And, you know, at one point, if you go back, and I could actually send you part of the clip, where Onita glances back and while we're walking back and forth, because, you know, afterwards in the post-match, you got to hand him his water because he does an endless supply of water he throws out there. Not only that, we were FMW and we were all together. Um, so you see him, you know, glance back and he's like, Nante uh, Maska, Skoshi Okane. And he's saying, Do yate, how do I say? A little bit of money here. These people are cheap. How do? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> they didn't go the full money. Huh? <laughs> yeah. When he when he um, cut the whole promo about CZW is cheap, cheap. And then he did the whole. Uh, it was so brilliant how he tied it in like all. You know, I, I know I'm blinded by my prejudice for him being my boss and all that stuff all this time, but. Um, you could see me standing next to him, giving the fuck you, the fucking thumbs down, throat cut. You know, this is bullshit. Because I thought about all the fucking explosions I've taken and what they just gave the fans. And I'm like, yeah, you can't lie to these people. But it was all a backdrop from telling Tremont, you know, in the ring that night, which, you know, we knew earlier in the day that Onita was bringing, you know, he just needed somebody else to go. And he just looked at DJ and said, hey, you're the owner of CZW. You come with us. And we'll have our match. So yeah, it was all they, big they bad drop. Japan after that, right? We did no Daiba, the ten man, and they gave us a squash win uh, for A Team Pro Wrestling leading up to that. Because you know, A Team about their entire undercard worked for the latest incarnation of FMW. But um, yeah, so going into it, it was Satoshi going, oh, "It's going to make us look so bad," and then they're bringing you know. 
He's like, they're bringing some of our crew over there. Like, we're going to have to fucking stand there and be like, what the fuck, you know? Right. And um, and I told him, I said, it's just it's the zoning laws, it's this, that, and the other. And I go, you know, I told him, I go, right about now I sound like a, you know, I, I've got more excuses in me than, than a nun giving a blowjob. You know, it's, <laughs> what are we going to do? Right. So, but, you know, he found a way out of it because Onita knew that, you know, but he himself, he was really pissed off at that because he was like, how the fuck are you going to disappoint a crowd that big? And, you know, he knew that it wasn't the regular crowd because he was going, do they always, he goes, you know, you couldn't cram another person at buildings. CZW always, and I'm like, no, trust me. You know, people are coming from other countries to come watch this, you know. Right. And he was like, well, how, how, how can they botch the bombs like that so bad? And, you know, that's when the talks began about zoning laws and, me telling them, hey, man, they just don't have the engineering, man. It's not like how it is. Like, you know, in Japan, you got that whole crew around you, man. These people have been using the same explosives for years. And, you know, you've got that big, long cord, you know, that big, thick wire. And when that barbed wire ball back goes off, man, shit. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, you know, with him, it was just like, Oh, God. And I knew going into it, too, I'm like, this is going to be such a letdown. Onita's going to think, what the fuck is this shit? And, you know, I, I just, afterwards, I was like, ah, man, that was fucking. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was like, that. you know, for what? On around that time, I, uh, before and after, I think. Yeah, and, and for what it was at the time, I was like, you know, man, I can't begin apologizing off boss. boss this looked bad. You know, and he's like, you can't take any of the blame. He's like, you can't take any of the blame at all for this. And I'm like, you know, I tried. I tried my best the entire week leading up to it. I was on the phone with DJ constantly, constantly texting each other. Me telling him, look, man, you know, my cousin was a roadie for Bon Jovi for, you know, six, seven years before they all got into fighting over money. And, you know, uh, this guy knows people. He knows pyrotechnics. He knows all these and then my buddy Dave came with me, who's a licensed electrician. And it was fo it was funny because when he showed up with me, he actually he went into the one part, the front. And I went into the side because I had to hook up with Panda and all the guys. And um, they thought Dave was like the inspector because he came up there <laughs> holding his clipboard. <laughs> they started booing him when he walked up to the building. He's like, yo, these people are savage, yo. And I was like, you just, you, I was like, you look like an undercover cop, dude. Right. But uh, yeah, going into it, I, I knew that it was going to be a big letdown. And at that point, it was like so many tickets had been sold, and it's like, what the fuck? What else can be done in this situation? There's no way right. around this. Well, basically, they either just need to not do it over here at all anymore, at least not try to do it. Not like they've tried it, you know. It's not like they're trying that this kind of match every you know, a couple of months or whatever, it's once in a blue moon, or just try and, you know, pay the money and have these people from Japan come over who who, who do it and bite the bullet that way. Otherwise, don't even try it. Yeah, and then on top of it, you're going to have zoning laws. But if there's any kind of way around those zoning laws, you know, when his idea is to come to America and still do his exploding barbed wire match, I mean, there's the footage of him going and meeting with Vince McMahon because of the whole FNW having a working relationship when they sent Shamrock and Vader um, fighting over in a cage for FNW. They had Sonny in there. 2001, they had Shawn Michaels and his students. and You know, it was still a WWE thing. There's that, uh, there's that footage of Onita meeting with Vince to talk to him about bringing an exploding match to America. And that was, I think, 97, 98. So, you know, um, you know, and Vince had minimal interest in it because he even thought about the zoning laws and, oh, God, what if somebody gets hurt and there's shrapnel in there? But with smaller indie promotions. That match actually, at that time, though. You got people like Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart. They wouldn't have done that kind of match. No, I mean, Shawn had showed up as a special guest referee. Uh, Sonny was out there, I think, one time as a referee. It was a way for Shawn Michaels to get his students to work Japan, too, because he had Spanky, Brian Kendrick, uh, uh, who else? The Shooter Schultz guy, Lance Cade, Brian Danielson. It was all of Michaels' 
students, basically. But no, he wanted to do it. I think I think it was with Foley or Terry Funk. Basically, uh, basically recreate the same magic with Terry Funk, and if not, Mick Foley, because uh, I think something might have piqued Vince's interest about, you know, uh, about the. I mean, Christ, they were selling out baseball stadiums. <laughs> So, I mean, they figured out, man, if these people, these Japanese could do it with a bunch of shit exploding. I can't remember exactly what Bruce Pritchard said on his show. I think he acted like he blew it off. I'm like, now, if Vince McMahon is not, he's not going to, you know, have a meeting with this Japanese guy who is doing record gates and all this shit in Japan, he's not going to give a guy at that time of day if he's not interested in what he has to say and about making money or drawing money. But, um, God, have you ever noticed, if you ever listen to Bruce Pritchard on that podcast, if that guy could actually say what's on his mind, <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> yeah. he, he pulls yeah. back an awful lot. As much time as he's spent around Vince McMahon, right. shit, right. <laughs> and he ain't telling, he ain't telling near the story, but, right. um, yeah, I think they were more focused on, I want to say Onita and Foley. Or it might have actually been Onita and Funk. Something along those lines. Something, yeah. yeah. Probably Foley, I would think. He was probably the guy. Yeah, and I mean, um, too, I mean, uh, look, look at the stuff that Foley wound up doing, all that dangerous shit with... Um, Jumping off the cage think, and all that. Yeah, Yeah, and no, just... I mean, did you ever think you'd see Triple H with thumbtacks? And did they do fire right. at a WrestleMania with Flair and, and Edge and Foley and them out there? I mean, so you, you know, could like see Vince going DC, outside the box. That was one of those ECW yeah. reunion kind of shows, I think, with the fire, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, even with ECW, he knew that there was some kind of nostalgic. So, I mean, whatever he could milk that for what it was... Yeah. It's just pretty much what they did. Right, right. Whatever they could milk it for, you know, whatever dime they could squeeze out of it, yeah, sure will. They did. Yeah. Very interesting, yeah. though. It's, uh, you know, when you look back at that at, at that AEW match and everything like that, they probably won't try that again for sure. But you know, it was it was a, it was a good match up until that point. I would say it was passable anyway. I mean, it was in, it was it was enjoyable. But like you said, everybody's just going to remember the sparklers at the end. Yeah, and um, too, it also got to the point for me where I started reading other people's statuses, and I would get involved, and I'd make a comment here and there. I wouldn't tell them, you know, the whole story or what's going down with this, that, or the other. But um, I think it was actually Rob Pines by himself. I had made a comment on his, and... A guy, a guy tried to tell me, oh, the whole thing was a big work. The whole thing was a big work. It was a work from the get-go. They never intended for anybody to you know, take a dangerous explosion, this, that, and the other. It's just like, I don't I don't even want to try to argue any kind of logic into somebody who thinks like that. Like, Who said that, Rob? Just leave that person. Oh, what'd you say? Who said that? Feinstein said that? No, it was somebody that was... You know, responding on under um, a uh, comment he made. Okay. Oh, he agreed yeah. with me. He was like, yeah, it was," and I told him, "I said, man, there's there's nothing like the real thing, baby. You know, it's like <laughs> all the explosions and all the other. He knows who I am. He's known me, God, like three decades now. But uh, it was somebody that had made a comment under his thing, and uh, you know, I corrected the guy at first, and then." Uh, it was the guy that was commenting under his status that said, no, the whole thing was a work. And, and you don't even want to try. You don't want to waste your, you don't want to waste your air even no. talking to a guy like that. That's, that's that completely clueless, you know, to think, ah, it was a scam from the get-go. They weren't ever going to make nothing explode. Uh, right. Waste the time. <laughs> oh yeah. Now I have a few more things for you, Tony. Uh, what, what was that IWGP? Divas looking title that I saw you post. That's a weird yeah, looking title. That almost that. looks like the Divas title unpainted, right? They unveiled the brand <laughs> new IWGP World Heavyweight title and all of its glory. And um, 
you know, back when I was in Memphis, uh, independent promoter who is now one of the top belt makers in the entire world, David Milliken. Um, my God, that was just, oof. Like I said, it looked like the Divas title fucked a bucket of chicken, you know? It's, <laughs> yeah. What, it looks like an unpainted Divas title. Oh, Lord, what an ugly fucking belt. <laughs> as much as people have had to go through for that thing, you know? Yeah. What a what a butt ugly what the hell are they thinking, man? Yeah, they'll probably oh. change that over time. They're gonna realize how bad that is. Somebody, I, I mean, I, I'm 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 hoping for that belt to throw itself in the fucking river. I mean, oh <laughs> my god, what an well, ugly you post, belt! You posted this thing about this guy, and I honestly had to look him up. I didn't really know who he was. Um, this Captain Ed George Eddie Farhat Jr. I guess he turns out to be he. What is he? The 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 sheik's son or something like that? Yeah, legit. He was the sheik's son, and um. And I guess he turned into a only, promoter or something. The only place he ever worked was for his dad, for the sheik, and um, I mean his sheik whole family. It was always. Yeah, it was the sheik's son. He wrestled as Captain Ed George on the undercard in Detroit for a long time until, um, he just eventually stopped wrestling and he was in charge of pretty much like an agent, I guess you could call him, or um, he was mostly in charge of the box office uh, because it was always the Sheik's wife, Joyce, that would work in that office, and then her father, the Sheik's father-in-law. So he always kept them with a good, you know, good-paying job and everything, and that territory always made a share of money because they could never go on record to say that a heel like the Sheik actually owned the whole thing because right. people were paying good money, filling out that Cobra Hall what was it yeah. every Friday night to watch him get the shit beat out of him? So yeah. that would have just killed everything to admit that he actually owned the whole thing. But uh, so Captain Ed George was a guy that just kind of hung around. You know, he was an extra body. He was the Sheik's son. You know, the Sheik thought he could depend on him. And, you know, they, over the years, they had their spats. And even to this, even before he passed away, people would bring up Ed George's name to Sabu, and Sabu would just be like, oh, I have no family. Fuck that guy. And right. you know how Sabu was about his own, you know, I mean, he yeah. worshipped his uncle. He, right. would, he will never go on record to say anything bad about him at all. But, uh, and Sheik is even cool with, you know, Judge Dredd. He never said anything bad about him either. And that was uh, another one of the Sheik's um, uh, nephews. But, uh, yeah, Ed George was the legit son of the Sheik. And it was a couple of years ago. Um, he he was making his rounds all over the place. He did this with several people because people started messaging me after I posted what I did. Because, you know, uh, I guess I'm the kind of guy that <laughs> kill me where I stand. If I wasn't a very nice guy to you when I was alive, don't praise me when I'm dead. You know, right. you know. I mean, be at least be honest. And I'll say, hey, Tony was a piece of shit. He ripped me off, you know, or whatever. Yeah. But I, I try everything in my power to never be like that with people. Um, he was pretty much from the carny days. You know, he was full of shit. And, uh, you know, in all truth and reality, it Who's was. He uh, from people? Yeah, he did this scam where he said, you know, uh, we're getting cable in here, 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 and. You know, we're we're starting up. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have cable in Jerusalem and just making up all kinds of crazy shit. And uh, you know, they tried starting up the AWWL, which was like a brand new Detroit territory, which had a set of decent tapings. And the Sheik was a top guy and a lot of good talent on there. But it, I think Ed George had his hand in that, and he was just his uh, legal name, Ed Farhat Jr. Um, anyway, for years and years, he always used the Sheik's success to try to rake in any extra dough he could. Uh, when the story started coming in about, um, another one I got was a guy that was like, uh, it was one of the Sheik's old, oh God, was it one of his headdresses? And the other, the nephew of the Sheik said, yeah, man, uh, He's like, I'll sell it to you, man, 100 bucks. And a friend of mine was like, wow, that's a great deal. And then uh, a couple of days later, Ed George gets back with the guy and goes, I'll sell it to you for $2,000. And it's like, <laughs> wow. it's like what, the, what is this thing in storage, you know? Like, yeah. Just shit like that. <laughs> but he somehow 
wind, wound up in Mr. Pogo's uh, inbox, and Pogo goes, this guy, and I go, I know exactly who that is. And I go, that's the Sheik, son. And he goes, well, I know the Sheik. He said, I don't know nothing much about his kid. He goes, find out, what does he want? And he goes, he keeps on messaging me, talking about, you know, he's got TV going here and there, and they're going to sell this TV to all these markets, and I mean, I could sell, I could send somebody, probably do justice if I had taken screenshots of our conversations, but it's the kind of guy he'll tell you everything you want to hear, you know, yeah. everything out of his mouth, you know, is, is praising you and just building you up. And that's exactly what he did with me. And then, um, then he dropped the bomb. Eh, tell Pogo it's going to be $2,700 for him to buy TV in our market. Your market for what? And, you know, I, when I started questioning him, you know, you saw him taking a step back. At first, he was still trying to pull the carny shit where he was like, oh, no, yeah, you know, uh, no, this is TV that's going to start up. We See, we have all this stuff in the can, and I've, I've, talked to the, I've talked to the studios and the TV stations. I go, which ones? You know, and so it was more than obvious. You know, he couldn't come up with he any was lines. Yeah. yeah, and, I mean, if you're not going to go on record, and, I mean, Usually you would kayfabe something like that because you wouldn't want to give up your stations or whatever, but it was just so obvious you had no deal with anybody, right. especially the moral line of questioning and how I was right. able to word it when Pogo was talking to me and everything because I was having to you know, say what Pogo was saying to him and then add on my editorial shit. Right. And um, the guy passes away, and I uh, just, you know, I made that status, and I, you know, I'll stand by that until the day I die. Yeah, you know, the I'm, guy died I'm, penniless. I'm like he was a very crooked man. Yeah, he died penniless, 77 years of age. Uh, died with, you know, owing a lot of people and lying and leaving behind a whole list of people that he screwed over for money that, you know, he did that because he mooched off his dad's name and um, right. died in a lot of pain due to corona. And it's, you know, justice has been served. Yeah. You know, he's bor- you see, um, borderline homeless. Yeah, I mean, speaking of shady, you know, shady people in wrestling, I don't know. You know, Synergy Wrestling, right? That's all. It went out of business uh, just recently because this guy Colin West, they found out was a a, a pedophile like or whatever. A pedophile. Yeah, yeah. I heard about what, that. What did you think of all that? Because that thing, that Synergy Wrestling, was on fire, kind of on the rift, on the indie <laughs> scene. A lot of wrestlers from, especially from the Northeast. We're doing very well there, and then they, I guess his name showed. I don't even remember. I'm trying to think, just somebody just yeah, found his a, name a, somewhere or whatever. Well, saw his picture, I think, on it, on like one of those lists. I think it was actually, it might have been the wife of Jeff Cannonball, uh, Tara Callaway. Yeah. She wound up finding this out, yeah, and she put it out there that the guy was, you know, had been busted several times in the past. Apparently for being a pedophile, and it's yeah. a shame because there's so much young talent that I know, that I personally know, that have worked out at a local gym that I work out at, and you know their heart was really set into it, and you know they would, hey, I'm doing good with Synergy, and I would hear the name, hear the name, hear the name, and it's a real shame because um, you know places like that, you know, just seem to pop up all the time. Um, very rarely do. They catch fire. I mean, one of them that did was like Beyond Wrestling. You know, when it caught fire, it just did. Yeah. But with Synergy, I knew that it was a place that was paying these guys, you know, I guess nothing. I guess it was just more about the exposure and and that kind of thing. And it just sets a really bad precedent of not having to pay talent, having to pay anybody. And I'm being not sure they weren't really paying anybody? I, I, if they were paying them anything at all. But... There's so many places. I remember that Sanctuary Wrestling, uh, Sanctuary Pro, and a bunch of my friends tried to get me to go there. And I was like, for what? And they're like, man, just forget about the money for once, man. We're all out there. We're all having fun. And one by one, they all stopped going there. And they all stopped working there. <laughs> What's up with but, yeah, uh, um, and, and I'm going to go back to that. I, the only reason I ask in the middle of all this is so I don't forget. What's up with Beyond Wrestling? Are they kind of shut down right now, too? <clears throat> Truly, I <clears throat> I don't know. Um, don't see I haven't heard them anything really about anymore. them in a, in a while. I I would yeah. figure them above all people would would keep on going if anything because they started out with the boys being the crowd, and they started mm-hmm. out you know taping and it looked like a damn near wooden barn like an old garage that the ring mm-hmm. hardly fit in. 
but the boys were the audience. So you would think that they were used to running things on low to no budget, and with how much they've built up the name and how many views they get on YouTube, there's money being made there. Their downloads right. and that kind of thing. Uh, right. But I haven't heard anything from that group in a long wow. time. Wow, I know it what's was friends of mine. Guy. Uh, what, what's the promoter's name again? Um, oh, I had him on once, too. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, uh, you stumped me. It's going to no, hit me, know. right? Like, <laughs> hold on. And hold when on. you do, I'm going to go, oh, yeah, that's right. He's got a real cool sound of last name. Damn it. I can't remember. Oh, Jesus. Hold on. I'm almost there. Hold on. True Cordero. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yes, yeah. True Cordero, who is also, wasn't he behind WSU for a while? Yes, he was. Yeah, with CZW. Yeah, he was a part of that as well. Yeah. With the women's thing, right? And him too. Um, I think they were starting out somewhere out in Ohio. So it was like a solid 14, 15 hour drive. But the guys from my local wrestling gym that I would work out with, there was like a Corvus Fear, Nick Talent, who is now Nicholas K with them and everything. Um, <clears throat> those guys would come back from doing those tapings and they would just be ecstatic about. Dude, it is such a brotherhood. Everybody there is so tight, and we all just about beyond wrestling. Yes, when they were starting yeah. out, they made this long trip, and they said it's like no money, and they're like, you know, eventually they they all saw money from it, but um, <clears throat> starting out, it was just like a total passion passion project by the boys, you know, to go out there for this Drew Cadero guy and. Um, I just know that it was like a really, really, really tight crew because uh, guys like uh, Nicholas K, Corvus, you know, they were always kind of sort of shunned in a way. Yeah. Um, they were at the one local wrestling school I went to. It was kind of sad, which is, you know, what drove me to being friends with the both of them because I was like, you guys haven't done anything wrong. Why do, why are these people like this with you? I don't get it. Yeah. And, do, you um, remember, um, do you remember Wrestle Circus from a few years ago? Sure, I sure do. With Al Al Lenhard and his wife were running it. I had one of my favorite interviews or shows, whatever you want to call it. It was uh, I knew Drew Cordero and Al Le Al Lenhart, the owner of that Wrestle Circus, didn't really see eye to eye on, on the way they put the shows out and stuff. I think Lenhart with Wrestle Circus was doing Twitch shows. That was years ago, and beyond rest, you know, Cordero was doing obviously YouTube and. I don't know. I just always got the feeling that they didn't like each other. So I said, what the heck? I'm going to ask if they want to come on together. You know, we'll, we'll tell them. I told them. I said, well, it's going to be cordial. It's not going to be like arguing or anything. And they both came yeah. on. And they, it was a pretty good interview. It was about an hour. And, I, you know, it was basically just both their visions. And it was years ago. It was like four or five years ago. It was a pretty good interview. And then after that, you know, obviously Cordero was right, you know, because Wrestle Circus really didn't last much after that. And they just shut down. The thing I love, though, is like Russell Circus. I mean, it was so unique. The mass gimmicks and stuff they would come up with and their yeah. undercard of matches were just so wacky cool. and bizarre and yeah. out there. Yeah, I thought, it was, I thought it was so awesome. There's so many groups like that that do that in Japan, like um, Kirichi Hanawa, uh, the guy that is the owner of Hentai Pro. He'll take his entire crew who dresses in purple tights. They'll have like females, dudes, mask guys, just everything. And it's so funny because like, the eight of them are like the ultimate sissies. Like, they never get in any offense. They're always getting the shit beat out of them. But there's eight of them. So how do you, how do you beat up eight people at once? Right. <laughs> anyway, um, they they would do, like, wacky kind of gimmicks like that. And that just, to me, that just makes it so much more fun. Because it's like, you know, what can you get away with within the parameters of, you know? Yeah, I think what it was with Wrestle Circus, I, you know, that guy, um, Lenhart and his wife, I think they, they just bit off more than they could chew. They both worked regular jobs, I believe. And I think, I, I don't know what their jobs were. I just, this is years ago. I haven't even thought about these guys in a while. But, you know, you can't you can't be in it halfway. You know, you can't run a promotion like that halfway and expect it to, you know, keep going you know, when you're just doing it basically yeah. as a second job at night. You know, it's just, it's, you got to be in, you know, day and night to, to make it work. And even then sometimes, well, not sometimes, most of the time it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, like another group like Chikara. You know, now everybody talks about who is who under the mass and everything. And 
that it's just completely over because of the whole Me Too movement with Mike Quackenbush and everything. Yeah. You know, he had a great he had a great product, man, and and a lot of the boys got a lot of work. And I know they weren't making a lot of money, you know. I know like undercard guys get twenty bucks here and there, but you know, um if there's a place to own your skills and someone that's running and running in front of crowds and you know, it's being put out there on D V D and, you know, that kind of hey, guys can't expect to get rich doing independence, but um even for Mike Quackenbush, like starting out, it was what him and Reckless Youth that co-own, you know, Chikara. And, uh, you know, you just, <clears throat> no matter what anybody has to say about him, good, and most of it nowadays is really bad. Um, you know, a guy like that, he could he could just about work a regular, I mean, the promotion would damn near run itself. You know, in right. the latter years of CZW, you know, uh, Zandig would just, be working his regular job and just drop in once a month to see how his CCW was doing, and that was it. In the early days, there was nothing he could do but, you know, CCW, because as much as they were going over to Japan and everything, you know, um, there's the same thing with with DJ Hyde and later on CCW. Right. That was his only job. That was his only thing to wake up and do was, you know, send people's DVDs. The same thing, you know, can be said for anybody could say what they want to about Ian Rotten, but you know, it's a full-time job. Now, you know, I guess he's got a regular job to help assist, you know, funding with his IWA, but um, it's always been these people's, you know, once you're a regular job and it's just an independent, you know, it's you putting everything that you got into it. It's everything right. that, you know, there's nothing more that you can do than, you know, even if you were to work a regular job, I found with my own promotion, I would just randomly start calling the boys or randomly start calling my camera guy or you know, while I was at my regular job and um, just talk about business and, you know, what can we do to, you know, we knew that we would always have that strange, like, cult following or whatever, especially with the no ring deathmatch stuff when we were starting out. Um, but even after we got the ring, I had so many people in my ear that were like, we should start up a wrestling school. And I had Brian Lawler coming over and, I'm going to start my own wrestling school here. And I'm just like, nah, I don't, I'm just going to wind up still working my regular job. You know, I don't want to undertake, I don't want to make everything about wrestling because, you know, I knew that going to Japan, that's all I do. You know, that's all I worry about is wrestling. And it's, and it is a job and you have to go to the gym and, you know, there's with the traveling and, and everything else, it would be impossible for me to work a regular job, you know. So it ties back to what I was saying earlier about Onita and the coffee shop and the restaurants and all that stuff. Uh, I can see, because it's Fukuoka, which is like eight hours from Tokyo, and that's too much for me to go back and forth because I used to have to do that with Pogo and WWS. I used to have to go from Tokyo, where I was living in Wino at the time, all the way up to Itasaki City, which is like a three-hour train ride. And this would just be, you know, hanging posters and going around with him and um, tickets for his sponsors. And, you know, me and me and Takase would go to one place after another and he would put out blocks of tickets and, you know, get more posters made and um, have to take all the stuff that Pogo had signed to the post office and mail it all off and everything while Pogo was busy doing something else. Um, yeah, it ties into it uh, in the aspect of if I'm up in Fukuoka and I'm not wrestling, you know, six, seven days a week, which is, you know, at this rate, I don't know if it's going to happen with me. <laughs> 47 years old, man, uh, either i got to slow down with what I'm doing on a nightly basis or, you know, consider life after wrestling. But, um, yeah, it's... It's one of those things that if I'm up in Fukuoka and I am working a regular job in Japan, so be it. You know, my house is paid for over there. Everything is good. Um, it's going to suck not sleeping in my own <laughs> room at night, but at this point, I'm used to it. And I have two people that actually live under my roof that are there and take care of the place when I'm not there anyway. And what they pay for rent takes care of my property taxes. And, right. you know, so I got very fortunate there. I got very lucky, but uh, yeah, you can imagine um, 
just on an independent company alone and making it your full-time job, you know, how many hours a week that you're really putting in, you're probably putting in way more than you are, you know, at a regular job. Absolutely. And, you know, just to go back to the Colin West synergy thing, do you think there was any way for him to come back from that after, you know, he was basically outed? Now, granted, it was 20 years ago, but I mean, you know, he changed his name. He obviously hit it. I don't know if he would have, if he could have just, you know, been honest about it in the beginning. I don't think too many people would have signed up, you know, and been like, you know, don't worry about it. We'll still work with you. It's very hard to tell. Some might have, some might not have. Okay, well, a couple of years ago, don't you remember when that rude guy, rude boy Riley guy? Remember when he was outed? And this guy, I name, yeah, yeah, this guy under his Google account had pictures of infants nude. Like, think Jeez. about how sick that is. Well, who was this again? I know, I, I heard the name. Who was this again? Rude boy, uh, rude, rude boy. boy. Oh, I think right, it was right, rude right. Boy. The wrestler. Yes, yeah. I do remember now. Right. I forgot about him. And. They had said within the last couple of years that he actually, yeah, that he had actually snuck back onto some indies and was still wrestling, like here and there. This was maybe like last year before the whole pandemic hit and everything. Right. Now, think about about that one for a fucking minute. That's crazy. Infants. Infants. And and just, 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 just let me insert this real quick. How the fuck do you get... Uh, uh, attracted to a freaking infant. What, what a, oh my God. I mean, to me, it's a stretch to be, you know, looking at a 12 year old. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. But an infant, I mean, what are uh, you looking at? <laughs> looking yeah, at even, even when flesh. I was 15, <laughs> even when I was 15, I wasn't into 15 year old chicks. I'm like, I don't know if their organs are fully developed. I was, 15, I was like, you know, know, remote control cars, wrestling, you know, <laughs> baseball, yeah. big Mets fan. I wasn't worried. But how are these adults looking? Is it, well, that's why this. Yeah, when you, when you, know, that's the problem. If, it, if any, if anybody out there snuck into the dad's stash, they weren't hoping to see fifteen-year-old girls or girls their own age. They were like, "No, let's see a chick, like a woman with let's see a thirty-year-old, right, boots. with hips and and yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that have a when good I was, like. When I was like, fifteen, I'll tell you that right have, now, that have when a I good... was fifteen, sixteen years old, I was I was going to the card store over here on Long Island. And and getting the penthouse that only this one guy would sell me, not to look for a fifteen year old my age. I was I wanted to see a twenty eight year old that had all the things that the girls my age didn't have. <laughs> the yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, that you knew was a woman and had a sexual yeah. past, and right, and, right. and you know, hopefully you could be in her history, you hear her in the future, you yeah. know, you could be with her, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even. Oh yeah, and you know, I mean. The front counter help, the girls that take all the orders and that kind of thing, a lot of them are, like, borderline legal. And, I mean, right. it, it just – even at my regular job. Um, and it just – it reminds me of this pie graph that I'd seen that was drawn up. And this chart told it perfectly well about how, you know, your interest as an 18-year-old in 19-year-old women. And they showed, like, right. the decline – until the time you hit like 50, as if to say like, you know, what can an 18, 19 year old girl do to stimulate your, you know what I mean? Like, what yeah. could you possibly have in common with her? Like, you know, she's going to be like, I want Jonas brother tickets. And you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. fuck that. I want to go to Bill Burr's comedy special, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like dude, infants, I mean, how That's fucked crazy. in the head yeah. can you, That's fucked in the can head. you yeah, humanly believe. possibly be? And you know what even makes it worse to me? What makes it magnified? Kind of like when people videotape their own crime, it yeah. magnifies it. What magnifies oh, it? Oh, like in when this they record this garbage. Yeah, what magnified it in the situation was, you know, I just learned about Google Drive and you know uh, about sending stuff out on Google Drive and that kind of thing. This sick fuck had it in his Google folders. All this. So, shit. It, so you could just basically find it right on his computer. He didn't even try to hide it. I guess it was he after you could you I just needed to say he didn't know any better. Or, yeah. Yeah. God forbid yeah. he hit the share button or something and yeah. then then, you know, somebody else's email. Somebody else would have fucking seen this shit. You know, it's, I, I just I'll never understand um you, you know, it's like a I'll never forget this, two thousand fourteen. So now at this point I've spent one month inside Pogo's apartment. 
And one by one, he started having people because it happened right around Isasaki City. It happened in Guma Prefecture, which is where he ran for mayor. Um, where, I don't know, wait, the, the Latinos that murdered the Japanese guy was 2016. But in 2014, that was the summer that the rape took case, where a man raped and killed a girl, but not in that order. And it was like a 12 year old girl. Right, grown man. Raped her then, right? Yes. So yeah, um, yeah. I wasn't trying to like spell it out like that. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> like that Jeffrey Dahmer kind yeah. of crap, right? <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> Holy shit! Okay, he so was um, with dead people. Yeah, and then when they busted him, he only had like, um. Basically cadavers and, and you know, right. what was he doing? He's boiling people's bones in acid. Yeah. That nobody would find. But then right, the right. only other thing he had was condiments in his refrigerator. Like, I guess he, he would he slap did. a little mayo on the side of the guy's face. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus. Fuck me. Oh, well, right. I mean, people are some sick fuck. But here's oh, yeah. the, uh, the, the kicker of this was they spent the entire summer in Japan in 2014, and it was the head story. For the entire damn summer, because they wow. were trying to figure out the psych- the psychosis of a man who would do something like that, that would rape a fucking dead corpse, you know, like 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 where like where did this go wrong? What in the fuck? And they would show pictures of him, you know, coming out of a building and and cuffs and everything, and right. you know, just like shackled, and and they were like, you know, what would make a human being this? And and it like almost like fascinated the Japanese people, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. but not like, not that much in an intriguing way, but like as to how a mind could be that sick, right. because right. it's so yeah. strange to them to see any kind of crime that grisly and disturbing and disgusting surface. Like, like what in the way you, you can't even begin to understand the train of thought. And right. this brings true, like this, this happened with a buddy of, of mine and many people. Um, where the guy got caught, uh, I guess he had been messaging girls and talking about, um, screwing them in front of their, while their kid is paying attention. And, um, then it was like bestiality and all that shit. Yeah. Oh, that's some stupidest thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just that's like, ridiculous. yeah. <laughs> some sick, and th- sick this is somebody. This is somebody that me and especially a good buddy of mine. Um, we had known this guy since he was like you know eight nine years old. He had been going to the wrestling matches, and you know anytime I had gotten a message from him, it was always you know I'm going to be a wrestler. I'm going to be a deathmatch guy, and you know this kind of thing comes out about him, and I was just like, oh my god, yeah. you know, fuck, dude. Never know who you're Man, talking I to never sometimes. Well, it happened with, I mean, this this one's out there because the guy got convicted and everything of it. Um, you know, what happened with Ken Wayne? Um, I guess at first it was the elephant in the room. I mean, he, I don't think anybody knows what it's like to wrestle somebody on all the house shows. Uh, he's wearing a mask as one of the Masters of Terror or the American Eagles or uh, one of the Nightmares or whatever. And then he comes back as himself. And then I wrestle under a mask or and I wrestle without the mask. So I'm wrestling him twice a night um, around all the spot shows that his dad ran. And, you know, he got busted from uh, DeSoto County uh, for uh, underage pornography. You know, I'm still very tight with the whole entire family. Uh, I hated it when his father passed because Buddy Wayne, you know, booked me in so many of those Memphis towns. But... When that came up on Ken Wayne, that shocked me because, like, he and I would sit there and openly talk about porn and shit all the time. And he never mentioned nothing about that. When he got busted, man, he got busted. And it's just like, fuck, man. The guy did five, six years in prison for that. You know? Crazy. So I guess just when you think you get to know somebody or you think you know Yeah, they have a whole different past. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, just because. Uh, just to put a, a, a bow on the Colin West thing, he he knew he was fucked when he got found out. That's why he disabled all his social media. He basically took the site down, just put, I think, a statement on it. I don't know if it's still up. I haven't even looked since that first day. He's done. I mean, his career just ended on a whim. 
you know, because of that. But yeah. I don't know, you know, you, you know, just because it happened 20 years ago, you're not going to get a pass. You know, can't fuck with kids. You know, you got to leave <laughs> kids yeah. out of it. There's so many. You know, go. Well, I mean, he he was a lot younger then, but he was. It's still a kid. You know, you can't do something like that and expect. You know, he obviously knew that he wouldn't be able to do this wrestling business. Uh, if they knew about it, that's why he changed his name and everything like that. But you know, if you feel bad for the wrestlers who, you know, like good people like Casey Cattell, the, the the female wrestler out of New Jersey, I think I've had her on a few times. She's a really nice, really nice girl. She was doing well over there. I think she had the belt. I remember she had that crown or whatever. I don't know if that was like a tournament or something. She was doing good there. And now just like that, all of that's just gone. And from what I understand, like all the videos are gone from those matches and stuff. It's almost like it never happened, which is even worse for the, for the rest yeah, of the I mean, team. For every Tanya Stevens, who is one of the best, you know, referees, and I hate to say, oh, best female referee. No. Um, she's a hell of a referee. And – uh, you know, she had her man outside the business, so it never interfered. Hey, Casey Carlisle um, down in uh, Delaware, I refereed several of her matches, and I go, that is such a phenomenal wrestler, you know. And then I go, and the fact that she's a female and has all those kids and is still all go like that inside the ring, like these are people that don't get brought to the forefront like they should or get credit like they should. But they're also females in a really rough business, but – they're females that do things the right way. They don't screw around with the boys, none of that. They have men, you know, they're already married, they already have somebody, and, you know, they're very faithful. And um, so there are plenty of girls out there that do things the right way. Um, but, I mean, for every one of those, <sighs> there there's a guy, you know, that just – and, you know, when uh, did you see the Mike Quackenbush apology? I remember it from a while ago, yeah. Everybody was like, <laughs> they said their piece about it was basically, well, he's so dramatic about it. And he, Is that yeah. really the way? And it's like, dude, no, that's really the way Quackenbush talks. Like, that's yeah. the way he's, trust me, I was there when he was breaking in from the backyard into being like, you know, trying to do like mainstream like Jersey stuff. Um, I would always see him and Joel Rules on the fringe of things. And I didn't even have my finger on the pulse on the East Coast, but I knew of him and I saw him coming up. And, you know, um, stuff like that's always going to take place. I mean, if I unraveled some of the stories and some of the horror stories of being around Memphis wrestling and some of the shit that I've seen there, you know, um, it's like the quote that Chris Champion put out. Of, hey, he was doing one of those shoot interviews about Jerry Lawler. They mentioned Lawler's name and Chris Champion goes, Jerry, I love you to death. But you know as good and well as I do that you would love to see your wife get gangbanged by that whole fucking locker room. You're a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Uh, but uh, and then when the stuff you know with Cornette and the hot tub, it's like oh, yeah, man, we like knew about that. Yeah, we knew about that shit for years. You know, it just it's he kind of survived that though, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, that's that one he's man's in, he's perversion. He's not wrestling or anything, but I mean, nobody really cares about that really after a week or so. Yeah, it's because it's one man's perversion, and it's not um, it's not any kind of um, how do you say it? It's not really hurting anybody else, right? Like here, right. I'll, I'll, not, <laughs> as long as he's not doing it like underage or whatever, right? I mean, from what we understand, it was just girls or whatever that. Agreed to do it, or whatever. I don't. I don't think it was anybody even famous, from what I understand. Right? It was just. I don't know. I don't yeah, remember guy, anybody's the, names linked to it or anything. The guy I split a duplex with here, you know, Whippany, New Jersey. Um, the guy today, I get a text from him. You know, he he's on the left side of the duplex. That's his, and I get the other side. And the guy said, "Hey, man," he said, "A uh, uh, Indian guy." He's like, a policeman was here knocking on door today. Knocking on your door today. I go, cop, huh? So I contacted the Whippany police, and I go, was somebody knocking on my door today? And they go, that might have been the, um, like that, that might have been the county sheriff or something. And I was, for a while there, I tried Uber, and, um, you know, there was some tolls and shit I didn't pay. But I just thought, if I was ever in that kind of situation, I'm like, 
Oh, well, I'm your average American male. I watch porn. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> uh, the stuff that's the stuff that's out there, there's no, you know, I can't stop the video and ask the girl, hey, man, are you 18? All I could do is go on Pornhub and hope for the best, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I, you know, we all, so basically we all have our own perversions. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody or anything or, you know, I mean, Christ, there's so many genres. You could look up, like, Himalayan banjo playing nuns that like to throw jello at guys' <laughs> balls, and, and you'll find something, I bet. Yeah. You know, uh, but I don't I, – you know, if someone's perversions are what they are and it doesn't hurt anybody or they're not trying to lure somebody in or or that kind of thing, okay. I, Cornette was not the guy that, that ever really – there's like some isolated stories out there about, oh, he said I could get a bigger push in OVW. Come on. You know, that only happened with you or with that guy. Right. Compared to the fucking Randy Orton's and all these other guys that are all jacked and good yeah. looking and shit. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. Come on. Some of that doesn't add up. <laughs> right. Tony, before you go, I want to ask you one last question um, because I'm getting uh, ready to. Well, actually, tomorrow uh, Congress has got Dilla comes out, so I'll be look. I might even stay up till three o'clock in the morning to watch it. It's going to be out on HBO oh. Max. I don't know if you're big into the monster movies, but that's my thing right there. Ah, oh. <laughs> 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 all the all the Godzillas, and you know, people get blown away, especially younger people, when I tell them Godzilla was a girl. Like, no way! <laughs> Godzilla was a female. She gave birth. <laughs> you know? Right, right. It's in the movie. Right, but yeah, I mean, um, and it's so funny because so so much of the indies that I did in Japan in the mid '90s, so much of the monster stuff tied in. You know, oh, I yeah. told you about the Uchu Meijin power. I told you about the Demon oh, yeah. Oyas. Right. I told you about the White Mummy, Black Mummy, Silver Mummy. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> then they would come out with a clone of, and then they would come out with Uchu Meijin X X X, <laughs> Uchu Meijin. XXV, you know, it's like right. uh, yeah. evil clones, silver Uchu Meijin, you know, just all this, you know, uh, th there's just so much you can do with monsters yeah. to keep it fresh and keep it interesting. There's so many different, you know, um, there's so many different angles you can do and, and so many ways that you could prolong and, and keep it going. Yeah. It's what always fascinated me about the monster movies. Oh yeah, it's 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 fun. I mean, you never outgrow it. That's the thing. The last question yeah, I had you you was pit about them, pit them was, against each other. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but the last question I was going to ask you about um, it's one more AEW question. What, what do you think? Uh, are they bringing in too many of these aging wrestlers from uh, whether it's a you know WWE, WCW? They all were in WWE at one point, though. In other words, like Big Show, Christian. You think they're they're going down a, a road they probably shouldn't because they're just going to look like you know WCW did towards the towards the end there when they were just bringing in anybody that WWE was done with. You think they should kind of stay away from that gonna... and just stay with the younger wrestlers that nobody's seen before? Yeah, I mean, how are they going to facilitate all these people coming in? I mean, right right about now, you say to yourself, "Yeah, Big Show will be good for a match here and there," and you know. Uh, uh, maybe a maybe a match for this, maybe a match for that, but how much more mileage are you going to get out of them? Even how are Christian, they going to? They're setting up Christian to wrestle Kenny Omega. That's fine. That's a match I would like to see. But what do you do with him after that? You know what I mean? Yeah, and to me, there's some interest, but uh, I, I I don't see it really building for the future. If they're going to go back to that, no. you know, I mean, no, not at all. That's my point. It's I like, just. It, you're going to get one of good to see. but that's it. It'll be interesting to see, but what do you do when those people are gone and they fade off? And, and I realize that, you know, I'm gearing up to have another run against a 63-year-old Onita and that kind of thing. But um, it's the undercards and the camaraderie and, you know, um, on, on you know house show nights getting to wrestle like Masato Tanaka, who's still got it and, trimmed down he looks great um i don't know i don't i don't see much of uh you know they talk about the future and all these guys are the future you know the younger crop out of aew but 
how are you going to you, you keep on signing these guys? Have they done anything with that Eric Rowan? Didn't he go there? No, no, no. He he just showed up on on the tribute show. I think that was a one one time deal. He showed up on okay. the, on on the tribute show, and that was it. But didn't wasn't did he get let go from WWE so he could go do that, or was he just released? I think he was done, I, I he was done with WWE, and he was just like you know a free agent or whatever, and they just brought him in for that one thing. Because he hasn't been there since then. But, I mean, that was last year. Now that was like five months ago, or whatever. So. He definitely is there, how, I don't think. You saw how lost in the shuffle. I mean, the last, what, three, four months with FDR, who were the hottest team in the world, yeah. and everybody was, like, dreaming of them versus Young Bucks. And, I mean, my God, I thought there would be so much more interest for all that. I mean, that they're, on, they're on every week, fast. but now they have them, uh, like, in a group with MJF and a couple other guys. And Tully Blanchard is like yeah, the manager. Well, aren't they like the uh, the new inner circle? Or, or, yeah, you know, like, I guess yeah. he took the inner, go circle, the inner yeah. circle. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad idea, but I mean, it's you would you're right. You would think that they would be having these these like big time you know endless matches against the Young Bucks, where basically every time they wrestle, the other one wins, and they just go back and forth. And I don't think the interest is there as much as they thought. So that's probably why they're doing trying to go in different directions, but. I don't know. You know, Christian. Didn't, they, uh, show, didn't uh, was it just for a one-off, or didn't they acquire like Zach Ryder, who was one of those guys that had yeah. massive internet following? Zach and Ryder. What happened? He was there, and then when they, when they were doing when they were doing this crossover thing with Omega and Impact Wrestling and all that, I, I remember seeing Zach Ryder like on that show one week. I don't really watch Impact, but and that was I haven't seen him since then. So. It's weird. It's like they they kind of like going in all directions. It's, I don't know. I think they're just yeah. Trying. I, I just if you're gonna acquire all this talent, I mean you're gonna have to find stuff for all these guys to do. And same, I mean, how is anything, one. how is anything supposed to make any kind of lasting impact or any kind of dent in what you're doing? If I mean, the people are so desensitized to. It's like it's seeming like like every week somebody new is added to the roster, and I mean, yeah. I bet and now honestly, it's to the point where people are are people no. even clamoring for anything that Christian is going to do, or no. they got him no. into something that's going to. It's all new fans. Was that, point? That nobody nobody's sitting there dying to see Christian wrestling again. I mean, he was a good wrestler. You know, he, he was, I mean, to me, he was like a, a level below, like, world champion, but still good. But his most memorable matches were tag team matches. I mean, he's not, you know, I'm not sitting there dying to see him as world champion or anything. He's not that good of a wrestler. But, AW, you know. Don't they, they, they have, did they have the Dudleys or were they let go or? I don't think they ever had the Dudleys. Yeah, I've like, never seen them there. Oh, wait a minute. No, they were in the Battle Royal for that all-in when they did the initial oh, maybe, pay-per-view yeah, maybe or whatever. one of those first shows that they did. Oh, all right. Never yeah. mind then. Um, but, but, but there's but so many I more names it, I can sit there. Yeah, Christian, uh, Big Show. Even when you think about it, like Arne Anderson, Tully Blanchard, they're not wrestling, obviously, but they're they're managing, which is fine. But I don't know. It's, it's, they're bringing too many of the old, you know, it's almost like just so they could have the name on, on the roster. You know, they feel like they're accomplishing something. But, hey, I mean, their money. Tony Khan's money, I don't think it's going to – I mean, that's why you, I don't think you're going to see, you know, that many new fans, you know, jumping on because no, nobody's really going to – they should be pushing MJF more, which they are pushing him. But, I mean, that's who – that's the face of the company now. You know, Jericho's another one. He's always going to be great, but I don't think you can really surround the company around someone, you know, like Jericho who's getting very old now and, you know, it's just you know, it's not his time anymore. But regardless, AEW is still the talk of the town. There's just a lot of people out there that, you know, and they're they're just going to pick and criticize and this, that, and the other. But um, does anybody really expect Mike Khan to not be on a microphone and not try to put over any of this? And, yeah. you know, um, people would have to understand his background anyway, that he is, in fact, big on wrestling. He always was. But, I mean, did anybody really expect him to not be on camera and, and just kind of, you know, just be a guy just kind of hanging around, you know? And yeah. I mean, I don't mind him had, on camera. He though. had to get it. 
Uh, what was it? Him and Shivani were on. Uh, right. I guess when they did the whole the whole thing with uh, Impact and and whatnot. I mean, you anybody else out there would have to expect him to be a part of some part of this, yeah. you know, or at least be the one explaining uh, when the bomb didn't go off or you know whose fault that was or whatever. I just uh, hey, my my only criticism with him was. Him just, you know, catering to such a smart mark mentality of, you know, uh, just just such a bad way to bow out and be like, oh, Kenny Omega built a dud or whatever. It's like, ah, that that is just, just be honest with the people, you know. You're going to lose a lot more ground if you're just, you know, ah. yeah. that, that, that whole thing. That whole thing pretty much bothered me. I mean, especially uh, – you had a chance. You had the stage. You had the. You could have just simply said, "Look, man, we're not familiar with these things, man. Look, we screwed up." You know, even if you refunded some of the money, some of the people their money, or um, uh, said, "Here, here's half off for our next pay per view," or whatever. At least you're doing attempting to make some kind of damage control. Uh, nobody in wrestling has done that before, and I, I know that there's all kinds of complications. With, I guess, the cable companies to, you know, do that kind of thing where, you know, but uh, still, um, he has got himself a hell of an undertaking. I mean, all that talent that's in there right now, I mean, uh, you can't feature everybody, but there's so many that's guys making so much money in there right now, yeah. That's why I think guys like Janela are going to wind up. Uh... I mean, they're not on TV really that much now anyway. I mean, when it first started, he was on pretty much weekly. And now he he was on like that dark show, which I, I don't want to watch. I don't watch too often that YouTube dark show. And now just sparingly here and there, I, I don't think they're going to renew, you know, some of these uh, indie guys that they brought in because how can they when they brought in, you know, they're bringing in guys like Christian and Big Show. Those are the guys that are going to be on TV. They're not going to, you know, they they could – you know, have Janela, a guy like Janela wrestle once in a while, but he's going to see less and less time, even on the dark shows. I don't think he's going to, he's going to see him that much. Yeah. And it, to me, it'll be interesting to see, you know, further on down the line. I mean, how long did it take them to finally put Kenny Omega into a prominent, you remember everybody was sitting there complaining, like this guy was having these seven star matches with Okada. And, you know, now, now he's, now he's, he's yeah, now he's bombing on the United States scene, and and I'm like, well, <laughs> what? You did you did you did you really think that they like between him, Cody Rhodes, Jericho? How oh, there's only one guy that could be on top, right? You know, no matter what you do, people are going to feel let down or whatever. Um, it's your casuals that you want, not that hardcore. That hardcore base going to team in, you know, is going to tune in no matter what. And yeah. like I said before, AEW is the talk of the town. Yeah. I mean, they it just seems to me they get so much more attention. Um, might be by a vocal minority or whatever, the people on the Internet, but uh, they always seem to be a part of the hot topic. You know, they always seem to be someone, a part of what's going on. I'll tell you someone who I really like uh, that I think is, 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 is becoming a star uh, in AEW, and is that Britt Darby Baker? Allen? Darby Allen too. Oh, I thought Britt Baker yeah. is is really doing well. Yeah, and um, again, there's only you know, when you get a, I guess when you got a Serena Deeb there, you know, and then you got all these other girls that are just so hungry and you know just so ready to friggin' turn it all loose. All the Japanese girls and everything. There can only be one that's pushed it, you know, more than everybody else. There's only one that's going to be pushed to the top. And she's not she even a champion. Get yeah. But, and, or it might be a thing, the thought definition. process of, might be the thought process of, uh, oh, she doesn't need a belt to be somebody. True. But yeah. to me, all that stuff and how it plays out in the future is what fascinates me about, you know, the current day and era. And uh, I wish I had more of a finger on the pulse of the product and that thing. But, you know, I know what I hear and, you know, what I hear pertains to a lot of casuals too. I mean, uh, cause people come up to me when they just want to talk about wrestling and with, with, with some of their line of questioning or the things they have to say, I'm like, I'm 
you got to understand something. You know, I'll, I'll tell some of the casual people, you know, for me, it's a business. I can't approach it. I can't look at it through your eyes, you know. You're the consumer, you know, and if that's your complaint and that's what you don't like what they're doing with the product or that's what you do like that they're, you know, it's like I'll take that into consideration because that's somebody that could be, potentially should be, somebody that's, you know, tuning in, giving them ratings, giving them feedback, buying their pay-per-views. That's what they need. They need the person that's like borderline iffy kind of, I don't know if I want to buy that next one. I don't know. If I, yeah. I think I could skip over dynamite this week, or you know. Um, you know, when you when when you look at some of the some of the wrestlers that we that we just mentioned, uh, if you could say to yourself, and, and and not not saying that WWE is obviously not what it used to be either. I don't think any of the wrestling really is, but. You know, when you look at like a guy like Dar- like you said, Darby Allen, or like I said, Rick Baker or MJF, if you could pitch them going to WWE and doing and, and being a star, I, I think then you have to admit that they're a star now. You know, you, you, obviously, you yeah. know, I don't think Joey Janela could go to WWE and be a star. Unfortunately, as much as I love that guy, but I don't think he would really can go there right now. But I think MJF and guys, you know, Darby Allen, Britt Baker, definitely. I don't think like Nyla Rose think, can go over to WWE and, and be a star, but there are some over there that, that could do it. I remember um, going into things uh, before AEW even. MJF was the shit. You know, everybody wanted a piece of that guy. Everybody. Had, All he, the independent. He had a, 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 not a, I don't think a tryout, but I remember reading that WWE was looking at him, and boy, did they miss the boat on him. They'll probably get him eventually. But they should have grabbed him. He should have been at that performance center. I think for that guy's level of experience, it is absolutely unbelievable. Just blows me away. One of the best talkers. He, One of the best heels. Yeah. And he looks and sounds and wrestles like a guy that has been doing it for so long. It just comes so naturally and easy for him. You know, his, right. his promos, yeah. everything about the guy. You know, and I'm 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 almost shocked that people haven't pointed out. You know, wow, he's not the biggest guy. That's okay. You know, because he doesn't have a lot of size. But I mean, I got um, everything else. Oh, he, he's he's everything that WWE. You know what I mean? Young can grow with the company and everything. Uh, I see it down the line for him. I think eventually he'll Absolutely. outgrow AEW. Yeah, I think so. I, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think it's a matter of time before he does outgrow him, but it's going to be further, further on down the line. Um, yeah. Within AEW, eventually there has to be some kind of implosion. You know, there, there's there's so many guys that are so good that eventually cracks will start showing up, and some guys might, you know, consider dipping and going to WWE if they're not under a contract or, you know, right, they're not right. going to keep everybody. The, no. the roster is huge, and it seems to be yeah. growing by the day. It seems that they signed somebody new or somebody else, and uh, you got what QT Marshall has got a whole bunch of guys that he trains, and right. so there's an endless supply of guys just dying, uh, you know. Right, right. To get on that, get on that stage. That's for sure. I have three minutes before they're going to cut me off. I have to, we we almost <laughs> have two hours here. That's my that's that's my cut me on blog talk. But um, oh boy, this was a great interview. Another great one. We always have great ones. But uh, this was yeah, a, I mean, I always have a blast one. talking to you. But yeah, Tony, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, this was a great one, and we of course we do this every month, and you know we'll we'll knock another one out next month. Yeah, I was uh, at my regular job. I was sitting there between this guy CJ uh, Edwin and this other dude James. I was like, got to get out of here, man. Got a podcast tonight, so I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm done, man. I got to dip. I got to get out. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I always look for, so forward to it, man. And I always appreciate your platform that you provide. And then we got to figure and, out something that we we haven't figured out yet is when you and we're not going to worry about it now, but when you do go j- back to Japan, we got to figure out a way to do it. At, at least, uh, even if it's like a half an hour one or whatever, you know, when when you go back to Japan every month, but we'll we'll worry about that because I can't just record it off like Messenger or something, you know, it's got to be on the blog talk thing so I could save it 
and then upload it to. But we'll worry about that, you know, in the fall. That's a long time off. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be a way around it. Um, yeah. Without it being astronomical for me to uh, to accept and, and speak from there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> and as, as much as we talk and everything, I mean, another two hours flies by in, in ten minutes. You know what I mean? So. Oh yeah, absolutely. This was, <laughs> this was a fun one. Uh, but again, Tony, thank you for coming on, and we'll talk again soon. Truly appreciate it as always. All right, and um, you got it. Yeah, just keep in touch, whatever you do, all right, Sam? Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Tony. Thank you so much once again, all right? You've been listening to Reckless Airwaves Radio. Check us out daily at RecklessAirwavesRadio.com for all the latest Reckless interviews, as well as other Reckless shows, including The Rob and Slim Show, Corrigan's Corner, and Straight to the Point with Percy Crawford. Yeah, we don't want to do anything to scare your children. That's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to scare anybody. 